7 o'clock. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering. May you make us leaders in this church as men seeking to do your will. Lead us with the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we study your word and direct us in all our doings, all our thoughts, all our ways. May they line up with you and your ways. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we're on page 51 of the study guide. Right. Wrapping up the fourth chapter of Mark. Jesus calms the storm. Vito, if you read that for us, please. That day, when it was evening, Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side. They left the crowd and took him with them in the boat he'd been in. There were other boats with him too. A big windstorm blew up. The waves beat on the boat and quickly began to fill. Jesus, however, was asleep on a cushion in the stern. They woke him up. Teacher, they said to him, we're going down. Don't you care? He got up, scolded the wind, and said to the sea, silence, shut up. The wind died and it was flat, calm. Then he said to them, why are you scared? Don't you believe yet? Great fear stole over them. Who is this? They said to each other. Even the wind and the sea do what he says. Thank you, Vito. What a great section from Mark. Uh, before we get into the specific verses, I want to read a little background for you about the Sea of Galilee. I know some of you have been there, some of you haven't, but I think we'll all learn something. The Sea of Galilee isn't really a sea, it's a freshwater lake, and today it's known as Lake Kinneret in Israel. But it's to us called the Sea of Galilee. It is the lowest freshwater lake on the planet. It is 682 feet below sea level. It isn't as low as the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea is not fresh water. It is highly mineralized content, that is the Dead Sea, and the salt in the Dead Sea is so thick that you can float on the top of it rather easily. But not so with the Sea of Galilee. As a result of that, there are different stratifications, literally three of the water that go down 150 feet and those stratifications have a lot to do with the surface of the lake at various times of the year. They have a lot to do with the content of algae, which has a lot to do with the content of fish. In 1896, one fishing boat alone brought in 9,200 pounds of fish. It is a prolific lake for the production of fish, and having that kind of water and that kind of resource in Galilee was a great blessing to the people who live there. It is surrounded by mountains. <coughs> Essentially on the west and the northwest, the mountains rise to 1,500 feet. On the northeast and the east, they rise to 3,000 feet, to the Golan Heights, which runs 42 miles in length, and the lake is only 13 miles. So it goes far past the lake. The lake is 13 by 8 miles. So it sits in a bowl, and the water that comes into the lake comes partly from some hot springs, but primarily from the Jordan River, which flows out of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is up in the north on the Lebanon border at 9,200 feet. So the water flows about 10,000 feet down to fill up this lake in this bowl. It is such pristine, fresh water that it provides even today about 50% of the water for the nation of Israel. So it was a tremendous resource to them for water as well as for fish. Scientists have done research on this lake through the years to study it. It is different than all other bodies of water in the world. And what particularly makes it unique is the fact that it is subject to very, very severe winds. And both in the summer and the warm part of the year, and in the winter and the cold part of the year, it experiences these kinds of winds. The winds that come in the summer are called the Serico winds from the east. They come typically every day from noon to 6 o'clock. They're pretty predictable. The wind comes down hard off the Golan Heights and a little north of that, and it comes down and it turns to the lake into a boiling cauldron and it's pretty much the routine every day during the summer. These make it a very treacherous place to be in a boat at the wrong time. The winter is even worse because the winter winds are cold winds that come from the north and the northwest. And when the cold air comes down and it hits the warm air that naturally sits in the bowl, it creates turmoil. The cold air goes through the warm air and causes tremendous turmoil on the lake. So there we are, Sea of Galilee. Now let's look at the actual text and then we'll look at the Old Testament, some Psalms, as well as Daniel 7, once we get through that, just to see uh, what the people of Israel envisioned in terms of God's command over water. So that day, when it was evening, Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side. What does that mean? What's the other side? 
Sitting at the side of the lake, I think the, the area of Gerizim, and Jesus make a promise, let's go so when Jesus say let's go to the other side, they go to the other side. Right, so he's they don't realize they don't, you see they forget right away the, the, you see the miracle and the disciples all kind of miracles. And the Lord tell him let's go to the other side. You, you already make a, a statement so you're gonna go to the other side. But so he's been teaching on the right side, in parables though, because he's bringing judgment upon those who would receive him. So now he decides to go to the other side, which is non-Jewish territory. So there's a transition, isn't there, in terms of this focus of spreading the gospel. Right? Now it was evening, notice that. So they're out at night. Matthew tells us that the storm occurred at night, just to make it all the more frightening. Okay. They left the crowd. Remember, this is the crowd that's been hearing parables because they're under judgment. And took him with them in the boat he'd been in. There were other boats with him too. That's an interesting line. I'm not sure what it means. Yeah. Is that the other gospels? A big windstorm blew up. The waves beat on the boat, and it quickly began to fill. Jesus, however, was asleep on a cushion in the stern. Okay. There's a sermon in that. <laughs> Jesus doesn't seem worried, right? And human, like he's tired. Yeah. So he's, yeah. he's taking a nap. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Now, if you've seen these boats, they're not large boats. Yeah, they're right? small. And, uh, it was not like a yacht where they had to like go send the skipper to find him. They could see him. Yeah. How oh, well, are the clear test then? You make you believe he was asleep. Of course, he's not. And sleep always when you want to sleep. That that's mean you trust God. Peter, on the night he should end over to uh, after they kill the uh, uh, James. So the Bible says in Acts of the Apostles he was asleep between two guards. You know, saying to God when the angel rescued. You see, what the, the following day he was supposed to die and he was asleep. Too. So that the trust in me, uh, I think. Uh, is a, a metaphor for trusting me now that everything will be okay. He who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. They woke him up. Teacher, they said, we're going down. Don't you care? He got up, scolded the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, shut up. That's an interesting translation. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I can't imagine yeah. Jesus saying shut up. <laughs> keep, keep still, so it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The wind died, and there was a flat calm, and he said to them, Why are you scared? Why don't you believe yet? Or as some translations put it, Where's your faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great fear stole over them. <clears throat> Is this? They said to each other. Even the wind and the sea do what he says. Observations, interpretations, applications on this before we get into some other scriptures which surround us with more promise of God's power. John. I want to ask a question of everybody. Do you think that this still exists today? What? Even the wind and the sea do what he says. Do you think that exists today? Yeah, every day. I like being a Christian. Well, I've prayed for calm weather, traveling and stuff like that, yeah. you know, for it to be nice. No, no rains, and yeah. you know, I, I believe he listens. God listens, and when it's his desire, it's how we ask for it. When it's not, it's not. That's all. But yeah, I believe that. We took a bunch of kids. We had about forty of us. Went to the end of the world, Mexico, about twenty some odd years ago, and one of the <coughs> projects was to put a new tar paper roof on a building that was two stories. Well, in that part of Mexico, it blows all the time. I mean, it's nonstop. It's like West Texas. And so we had about a half a dozen kids and a couple of adults. And we had these rolls of tar paper that were about as long as from here to the end of the room. And we had to get them actually over and onto the face of this. And so we said, OK. We're doing this for the Lord. Lord, would you stop the wind while we put this up? And we picked the paper, we picked this long sheet of tar paper up, and the wind stopped, dead calm. We could see it blowing around, but where we were, dead calm. We got the piece on, nailed it up, wind started up again. 
We did that three times. And every time, the wind totally stopped. And, uh, so that what Jesus did here, and I've done it other times, you know, I've prayed for this and asked for it, and seen God do these things. So it's very interesting that what Jesus did, what, 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> is absolutely available to us today. To understand the background of how the Israelites saw the deep, would you read Daniel 7 for us? No. Yeah. Daniel's dream of four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was, li as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision, at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening, and very powerful. It had, a large, iron, it had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. His hair and head was as white as like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I, couldn't, I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming out of the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was, stir was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. Mm -hmm. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and the most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. 
then the sovereignty, then the sovereignty, the sovereignty power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Thank you, Adam. So this is an important messianic prophecy as we think about Jesus as commanding everything, the sea, the land, all creation. Daniel said, in my vision at night as I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. We see references to this kind of prophecy in Revelation for sure, but for our purposes tonight, as we look at Jesus calming the storm and what will happen next with the garrisons on the other side and what that will involve, this is an important scripture. This would have been on the minds of Jesus' disciples. And as he shows his power, both over sea and land, this would no doubt be something they would recognize. One like a son of man. But they would only see in part, right? As we'll see in the next section, they're pretty terrified. So that's an important scripture to know about, Daniel 7. Okay, Ray, would you read Psalm 89.9 for us? You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Okay, when its waves mount up, you still them. And Larry, Psalm 65, 5 to 7, please. Yes. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them who are far off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, but still at the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. Thank you. So those are just a few psalms that speak to the Lord as commanding all creation, including the seas. If we, if we go back to the book of Genesis, the spirit hovered over creation. And out of chaos, God brought order. Do you remember the part where Jesus actually walks on the water? So we have another instance where we'll see how he commands everything, even still to see. It seems to me there, uh, the reaction in this case, at least according to how it's been going, is that this may be the first time they actually see him and say, okay, uh, I think we're dealing with something higher than what we thought. I think, you know, up to this point, I mean, you know, they may, I, I'm sure they've thought of him, you know, as, as you know, as a teacher and someone, you know, to, to you know, to be, um, to follow, you know, but perhaps they've still thought of him as a man at this point. And, and maybe at this at, at this juncture, they're like, maybe we're dealing with something more than just a man now. Maybe we really are within. Maybe we really are hanging out with somebody who's uh, who's in touch with you know. So there's a transition from the healing of human beings right, to, the healing. to in a sense the healing of creation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So it's expanded. Yeah. Do you think they would have been pretty familiar with all these scriptures that were alluding to him? Before the most story. good Jews would have known the book of Psalms, if not by heart, by strong memory, and they would have sang them all throughout the year. So the two Psalms we just read, absolutely. And I'm sure they would have thought, at least some of them, that sounds a lot like Psalm 89 9, what we call it. Wow. Uh, Daniel 7, they certainly would have known about the prophecy, whether or not they tied it into the fact that the Messiah will control all beasts of the sea as well as the land and the nations. We don't know exactly what they're thinking, but. Any Jew who went to synagogue and studied the Torah and the rest of um, the scriptures would have known these stories. Yeah. Um, so there's one comment you made that I find very interesting. It has uh, new meanings to me in recent months and years. Uh, we read all of Jesus saying certain things, or something somebody else uh, following Jesus quite important scripture and doing certain very things. They all feel implying or in invoking a certain scriptural statement, what it recommends, and what would be acceptable. But I find what is really interesting is that while there are always seem to be some people who would like to make more out of scripture what it's being would be than God intended it so that it would sort of support a non-Christian thinking about something. But what God is really always saying to us is 
Joe, I've taught you in the past some basic meaning and reasons why I gave you certain scripture to hear, and for you to hear, and for people, people spiritually oriented people to quote at certain times under certain circumstances to help you understanding what the situation is and what can be done about the situation. But I want you to realize that don't ha just haphazardly always looking for a new meaning that a scripture would have, but realize we never have been explained all of the good meanings that can come out of scripture. Whenever somebody, you know, a scriptural person, the knowledge, quotes a certain concept or certain words, and maybe an occasion now that is somewhat different, and our mind is now somewhat different and more open to change, so that we now have a new lesson to learn about something we could not have learned in the past. Well, in Jerusalem, the, the people who were in the boat, the disciples, how well versed are they on scripture? How do you think? How well versed were they? Did they, did they know scripture? Because uh, I don't know if they ever know the scripture where they actually joined Jesus when he went to the synagogues. When he overturned the tables at the temple, they, it says that they occurred to them, they said, oh, he'll have zeal for his father's house. So maybe they were pretty familiar. Yeah, yeah but, that, but that wasn't, I don't think that was the, uh, was that the disciples who ordered that? that they, it's, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it occurred to them. They, they, they thought of it afterwards. They said, oh, yeah, it does say in, in, in the scriptures that, he will, that the Messiah will have zeal for his father's house. I think in, in this situation they are very scary because they never know. Oh, okay. <laughs> in that time, we, I think the script, maybe they knew the script, but, but, but in this situation they are, you know, fear for their life, you know. And, uh, Jesus already told to go the other side. So the other side was after you see the, the demon possessed, but that area was, uh, Satan had a strong wall, you know, years ago, before, well, that the tribe of... Uh, Get, uh, if a travel Manasseh get the, the install before in that area of Jordan, but was a short run, so more the pagans, all shrines, all kind of gods, and, and they say, now we go to, I think the mind of the disciple, we go play with the Satan, so that's who, that's who we got now, we got already a storm, you know, we go, you know, play with the devil, so you already had a storm, and we only then get it, the other side, or what they get? A guy possesses all, all demons, so it's like a, a foreshadow. And, and the, Jesus, the, we go to the other side in that country of, of all demons now already. You, that's the reason you are in the storm already. But it was our Lord test them. Well, as we often see, and this is a good example, John, we talked about, it's often after the fact that the disciples put two and two yeah. together. Yeah, I mean, these guys were experienced decision. Yeah. yeah. And we just heard that. This type of storms happen all the time. Yes. So when this happened, you know, I don't know if they were as as fearful as we're putting, portraying them to be. And the, the what I find amazing is that they probably are experienced sailors, mm -hmm. fishermen. That if that happened and the boat was being swamped, they would tr they would do something about it. But they did. They went to him and said, "Teacher, don't you care about what would, what's going on?" So I would, I would think that if you, something was going on, you would take it upon your own, yourself or yourselves and do something about it, rather than going to even caring that this guy's asleep. You know, why don't you start bailing, <laughs> you know, instead of, instead of complaining or, or going to him? What, why did they go to him and not start, start bailing themselves? Well, this is, yeah, this is a good point. A lot of people. You know, they, they become dependent. They never take that step where they really have to think for themselves. That's, you know, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, but it would be good to be dependent on him. Oh, yeah. I think that's right. He's bringing up to that point. I've, I've been, been so. in a boat, and I, I've been in a situation where it was filling up, and the, 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 uh, the storm was um, pretty intense. And the 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 out the the water coming in was a lot 
greater than I was able to bail yeah, out, yeah. and the self bailer was over run, and um, we, 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 we capsized. We uh, got dragged into the shore. Everything, everything is okay, but if if your butt is is filling up, I mean, the, the fear is very <laughs> present. Right. Get, get it out. I mean, it, it, it was it was. I've been in occasions where the water was coming in, but it was just sloshing around. We can t handle that. But when it's up to your knees <laughs> and, and the gunnel is a, a little bit more, that's really fear. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I was really afraid because I know we, we could handle the situation, and we did. But it's, uh, I can understand there being really very fearful at the point, and then and have it, have it uh, immediately handled um, would be a, less, less, a big, be a lesson to me right in the, uh, then and there. This is, like she said, it was, um, this is different. People would be but, talking about it 2,000 years later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it's in 1986, it. they discovered one of those, the Sea of Galilee boats. We went there to see the boat, you know, they, they use uh, the process to, the, the, the boat was in the mud. Now he's in the Royal Museum, yeah. and the boat is maybe from here to there. I, I doubt if somebody was sleeping that boat. <laughs> I mean, our Lord was clear awake, you know. He, he, he was testing the disciples. To, the, he, he, you see the, their reaction, the way that they are with them, you know, if they really react in faith or, or they, 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 they fear, as he said, to cover and, they, and they, they, no doubt was attached. Yeah, I agree. It was testing. Yeah. testing. Yeah. Jesus was definitely testing. Yeah. I find it very interesting that they described him. They're they're an extremist, and they're, they're sailors, as Ray was saying, and they know what's going on. And all of a sudden, they say, "Teacher, yeah, teacher, not savior, not God, not, but he's a to him. He's a rabbi, rabboni. He's a guy who teaches." Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they go to the teacher for something which the teacher has never made any manifestation about at all. So somehow, um, in reading this, they are assuming that he can get them out of this mess. Uh, because he's healed these people. All, all we've read about so far in Mark is he's healed some people which is pretty darn miraculous, but we haven't seen anything that transitions, as you were saying, into the physical realm. And all of a sudden they say, and don't you care? I mean, that's pretty accusatory uh, to Jesus. Yeah, but what, what were they expecting him to do? Good question. What do you yeah. What do you yeah. think? I don't think they were asking him to calm the sea. They were just saying, "Hey, get out!" This is yeah. Yeah, 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 maybe that was bad. Yeah. 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 They were yeah. surprised when he did command everything to stop. Yeah. yeah. And when you look at the old scripture, they never had the feeling that he was God's son. That the only one that that can do everything. They only realized that basically once he was dead, he rose again and came to them and she showed him here. I have to tell them, that's, that's on my, neck, my hand, my nails went yep. there. I'm here, I'm God's son, basically. And that's when they realized it, basically. And so I turned around. Before that, they thought he was a miracle worker. We I mean, thought even that he was the Messiah which defeated yeah. the Romans at military part. Right. Because they didn't want to drown. You must have come up. See the when God depart uh, the Red Sea, the world the lights there across, they really believe by faith that God can uh, drive them to the promised land. The answer was not. And they, it was not a bigger miracle than that, uh, the, you know, the, the sea into uh, uh, and they walk in dry ground. And the, for a few months after he tell that was not the God who brought them out of Egypt. You see how how far away you can you can go uh, you can go uh, 
And the disciples, the disciples are like us. They are in, in, like in training. The, the, our Lord put them in situations they can be, later when he resurrect to heaven, he, they got to handle by themselves. So now is a, a, a time of testing. Is the way handle some situations if they are prepared when he gonna die in the cross to end over, you know, what the teaching and they took, you know, they started the church. That's that's the, the job of, like us, you know, prepare the disciples for ministry. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the same. Should, should, they, we, should we mention Jonah? Or tell, tell you what, let's look at the study guide where there are references to things like that. Uh, page 52, John, will you read for us? Uh, second paragraph says, put these pictures together, what do you have? Let's start with the part from Fisherman. Apart from fishermen, the Jews were not seafaring people. They left that to the Phoenician neighbors to the north. The sea came to symbolize for them the dark power of evil, threatening to destroy God's good creation, God's people, God's purposes. In books like Daniel, the sea is where monsters are came, where came from. So when Jesus rescues the disciples from the storm, we are witnessing something which says, in concrete terms, what the parables earlier in the chapter were saying in word pictures. God's sovereign power is being unleashed. That is, God's kingdom is at hand. It isn't like people thought it would be, but this is the real thing. It's the same power that made the world in the first place. And this power is now living in Jesus and acting through him, just as in Daniel 7, the monsters who've come up from the sea are finally put to flight by one like the Son of Man. So here, Jesus assumes the role of God's agent in defeating the forces of chaos. He isn't a Jonah running away from God's command. So the disciples don't have to throw him overboard. He is doing exactly what the living God wants. <laughs> the forces of evil are roused, angry, and threatening, but Jesus is so confident of God's presence and power that he can fall asleep on a pillow. The disciples are cross. Doesn't he care the boat is about to go to the bottom and take them with it? Jesus quizzically reverses the question, putting them on the spot in the way in which Mark is using to build up toward chapter 8, don't you yet have faith? When you read a good book, you often see only the point of the earlier bits when you get to the later bits. Indeed, one of the definitions of a good book is that it needs reading at least twice. Anyone who already knew, knew Mark's whole story might well read this paragraph and see in it like something looking, it's like someone looking the wrong way through a pair of binoculars, a tiny version of the whole thing. Here is Jesus with the disciples going about their business. Here are the forces of evil, madmen shrieking in the synagogue, angry men plotting, powerful men capturing Jesus and putting him to death and here is Jesus, who is now not asleep on a pillow, but slumped on the cross. We hear his voice. Why are you afraid? Don't you believe? And on the third day, the storm is still, the tomb is empty, and the great fear comes upon them all. Who is, who then is this? <coughs> Imagine this as a blockbuster movie. It would need a big screen to do it justice. And an audition, an audition for the part. Make it your story. Actually, if you sign on with Jesus for the kingdom of God, it will become your story, whether you realize it, whether you like it or not. Wind and storms will come your way. The power of evil was broken on the cross and in the empty tomb. But like people who have lost their cause and are now angry, that power has a shrill malevolence about it. Christians, the church as a whole, local churches here and there, individual Christians can get hurt or even killed as a result. Mark's first readers probably knew that better than most of us. They would have identified easily with the frightened men in the boat. That's Mark's invitation to all of us. Okay, go on, wake up Jesus, pray to him in your fear and anger, and don't be surprised when he turns to you as the storm subsides in the background and asks when you're going to get some real faith. <laughs> challenging. I, I have to say that I have once been on the Sea of Galilee, and the day that I was on the Sea of Galilee was not a storm, but it was not a very pleasant day. It was a little drizzle, and 
And all of a sudden, as we were out into the water some distance, the clouds broke open and the sun came out and it was just a gorgeous rainbow. This true. Mm -hmm. wow. and, uh, so that's, that's, I, I would prefer that experience to the one that you But I tell you about my one experience on the Sea of Galilee. There, there are two, I think, really relevant water stories in Scripture that these guys should have been aware of, and Jesus may have been trying to make that reality. The first one was when Moses parted, put his cane, his staff out, and the sea, of the Red Sea parted, and they walked through on dry ground. And then he took it away, and all the Egyptians were killed. And Joshua did the same thing when he led them across the Jordan. He said, when you put your water the, to the priests, go step in the water, and it stopped. And it may be that Jesus was trying to demonstrate that the power that God had then to control the elements was still real in his time, and he showed them it's not the Red Sea, it's not the Jordan, but it's the Sea of Galilee, and I can, I can mm -hmm. speak to it because of my connection with my father. I'm wondering if that, because they would have known those stories. Well, that's a great insight. And when, he's, when they say, who is this? Yeah. It does have allusions to, what is your name when Moses said, I am that I am. Yeah. So the whole idea of your name, who are you? Yeah. Or Jacob wrestling with the angel. Yeah. The whole question of what is your name? So there are these moments throughout biblical history, even up until the time of Jesus, where it's a question of, who are you? Yeah. We can ask that today, God. We believe, we know the living God through Jesus. That's the difference. Um, but it's still a matter of exercising faith each day, saying, show yourself to me, Lord. Yeah. And would they have thought of Jesus as, like you said, a Moses or a Joshua in the same way? You know, they were just prophets. Is Jesus just also just a prophet? So I don't... I believe that at that point, they, they like saying before, they still didn't know that he was the son of God. They thought he was just another prophet. You know, Moses separated the water with a staff, and yeah. you know, he stepped on it. Joshua said you see, he stepped on a rock. So if Jesus went like this, then you know it's God working through him, but he's right. not necessarily the son of God. Right. Yeah. So they still had a faith problem. And they're still calling him teacher. Yeah. Let's remember Peter's confession when he says, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Yeah. Jesus says it's not flesh and blood that have revealed this to you. Right. So we can only believe by the working of God and the Spirit yeah. giving us the gift of faith. That's the very first sentence in Mark is the beginning of the gospel. This is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So with the benefit of hindsight, you can write this. Right. That's the very first very first thing he says in Mark. Mm -hmm. Please tell me stories, uh, situations, and recalling. Just to prepare you for what's coming next, there will be a reference to a clothless man, all right? And that was a sense of shame if you were a Jew, not to be clothed. Yeah. Like the Roman statues, they would cover them up. The Roman statues would have, you know, the whole human thing. body revealed, right? Nothing left to the imagination. The Jews found that offensive. There is a reference to a, a young man that run away, runs away naked at the time of the yes. arrest and the cross. Yeah. Many think that's Mark. And oh, that wow. would be a, a real point of, of shame, the wow. sense of I mean, being in a very low place, running away naked. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Mark begins the gospel with that certainty, but he certainly wasn't there at the time of that moment in his life. And so. it clearly being naked had some sig great significance. I've never figured it out, but if you go back to when Jonah was drunk and his... No. I think the youngest no, no, son, no, 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 Noah, no, no, Noah, no, excuse me, Noah. And his youngest son said, look at our father. And the other guy said, no, no, no. Well, the youngest son's whole lineage was cursed. And you can see it. That's where the Canaanites came from, if I'm correct. And so being naked was, this was long before what we're reading here, apparently had some huge cultural significance. Well, it probably goes back to the Garden of Eden after well, they oh, tasted the go. fruit of evil, yeah. you know, that they realized they were naked and they yeah. were ashamed. 
Yeah. Well, it's not only this, I was just reading today, Chronicles, what the, the message, the, the King David said, message is another king, and he didn't believe him. All what he had to do in order to find him or change him and not go back to the old people, he cut that, that, that uh, clothes in half and cut the beards off and have, cut them off totally. That was at the end of it. They did never wanted to see any other Jewish people anymore. So you didn't have to be negative. You cut it down too. <laughs> half of it. Great insights, great thoughts. Anything else before we press on to Mark chapter 5? Nick Ness is uh, all of us before he comes to the Lord. The Lord is one to clothe us, like he clothed Adam and Eve, the same God that clothed them because they are next to the same, but the Lord kills some animals and put some skin. Our Lord clothed us with his righteousness. He's a, because he, we, we never attend that by ourselves. So when you are in Christ, uh, we put all his his righteousness, everything he gave. So you are when you come when you are naked to and uh, and uh, the sin put us naked before God. And the God he, he sees everything you know the sees that and but the, in the through the Bible clothing is always even is a picture of marriage on you know, the boy Ruth was in threshing floor she waiting for Boaz you know come the night so we ask him to clothe. When he put clothes, this is a sign of marriage. You no, know, some, you know, we li like our Jesus. The the, uh, the church is li like all the, the marriage. So we clothe us. The same, same, I think, same uh, metaphor. Yeah. As a bride is adorned from a groom, clothe yourselves with Christ. Paul said. So mm -hmm. we got a topical study on that, couldn't we? Yeah. yeah. It's it's 40, 40 and forty-one to me are a little intriguing. Because Jesus asked them, he said, why are you scared? Well, I don't know about, that's got to be the ultimate rhetorical question because they're all terrified they're going to drown. You know, don't, don't you believe yet? And their response was great fear. And the NIV says they were terrified, stole over them. Who is this? So... I mean, they've seen him do these healings, and there has to be some other stuff, but all of a sudden, he speaks to creation, and creation responds. It's, it's an interesting thing. I, 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 and and I, my, my, my interpretation is this. Is he's, he's, it's almost as if he's rolling his eyes. You've got all of this history. You've, yeah. You're, you're yeah. the children of God, okay? You know, yeah. I'm, 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 I am who I, you know, I am what I am. And do you still have no faith after all of this, all of your history, all of the things you know? All right. It's almost as if he's just like, but you guys are never going to think of it. think of this think of this story in the other direction. What if the apostles were completely faithful? Are they sleeping? Or are they just sitting by the boat? Is the water swashing? Um, this is a teaching moment. This is us in the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is Jesus making a huge point, yeah. revealing himself. But if I, they were faithful right. and they weren't fearful, then they just get the other side. Right? So, I, mean, I think that also plays to the human aspect of everybody because of the fact that you know, even with uh, you know, things put right in front of your face, it's still sometimes very hard to believe. Yeah. Right. You're saying that why didn't these guys believe? Yeah, I mean all the stuff that they had. Right. Here? Well, they, they, well, why don't we? Because we have all the right. They, they, the they, they, the right. They got the end of the story. Right. right. You have the conclusion. Right. right. And 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 I think it's it's hard. It's hard to do that. And and even with the amount of history that we have here, you know, and we've looked at you know it, with with Joshua and you know knowing you know Moses' stories and and all the other stories, you know. He's just basically sort of affirming it to them. I think that's really what it is, isn't it? And it, just that it's just like, you know, you still have no faith. Okay. Okay, I'm going to show you one more time. Right. Here it is. <laughs> you you know. didn't get it all these other times? Here's another right. example. And it's almost as if that's... It's and then weird. they're finally like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Well, we got to really think about this one now. <laughs> Well, they were it's terrified. They were originally terrified of the storm. Right. But then, when he said, when he calmed everything, 
they were terrified. So that uh, what, they're it. more terrified of what he can do right, right. than actually yeah. the original storm. It's an, so it's an that, interesting thing. That's a that's a great insight into they always say the fear of the, the Lord. Fear of the, Lord. Yeah. the fear of the Lord because he the is beginning of wisdom. So beyond awesome what he can do. And here's just a little taste of what Jesus is doing. Oh, be quiet. Go away. And just like that. Well, hmm. what, what did he expect them to do? That's, what, that's my question. It was because he, they expected to die in the boat. Is that the reason why? You know? And what did he expect them to believe? What was Good their question. belief at that moment in time going to do for Good them? Question. What, if, what if their waking him up was a sign of their faith? Right. Do something. Well, yeah, well, yes. yeah. Yeah, but they, but they said they were afraid of dying. That probably is where that came in. You know, it was because what what could they do outside of wake him up? Yeah. Well, and that, and well, put yourself in the they could tell the storm to stop themselves. Position yourself. <clears throat> How would you react? Would you believe in it? You tell no that who he is. What would believing in him have to do with your situation in the boat? That's what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> in other words, what, 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 what is Jesus expecting them to do at that point? He knew what they would do. Do you think? I, mean, I think he. I think he knew. They're pretty. Their track record is not good. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just. And again, they're at the beginning of the story. Yeah, yeah and they're not even at the. But that think of think of every miracle that he performed. Yeah. They had five thousand there, and they had a lo you know, s some fish and loaves. Yeah. Lord, what do you want to do? And he Maybe. asked them. Yeah, he knew what he would do, right? Maybe he that's what they were doing, well, asking him to do something. You know. Right. Why are you sleeping? How, get, get, and, get up and do something. Great, great point. How does that apply to us today? Because the miracles don't what bring it, nobody to the faith. It's that point. You can be people raised from the dead. How many, how many Jesus raised from the, the dead and uh, raised people from the dead? He, all kind of one after the resurrection, how many believers you have? So we preach in the, in the area, maybe t today, the there are couples between almost uh, that area, the country of Syria, Finnish, Lebanon. Uh, Jordan and all Israel bigger than so maybe more than 7,000 people believers you have after resurrection it's very clear we will really faith is God who reveals the faith and faith is God test is the gift and the God put on us and you our Lord is one develop, developer that faith through situations too most of the time like us we fell but Oh, you learn the lesson, that's the key. You, you, when you fail, you learn the lesson. You learn about your mistakes. That's the point in, in this. You, you fail because maybe the Lord wants us to move another step. They stay in, in the same, but you know, maybe they learn with, 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 with in this situation again. But faith, all miracles don't bring nobody to the faith because people, they want the, the, that sensationalism, you know, people, you know. But faith comes from, you know, it's a gift from God, you know. Last week we looked at the concept of the seed, which is defined in the Bible as the Word of God, mm -hmm. and it falls on different kinds of soil. Absolutely. What kind of soil do you think is happening in this story? Remember, Judas is in the boat. What's happening with their inner soil in the midst of this? And what happens to us today as we go through turmoil and difficulties? I mean, we, we ask God, we ask Jesus to help us all the time. And it's not like, okay, you know. Lord, you know what to do. Go ahead and do it. You know? and we so we, right, we ask, but do we always stand up to that ask? Right. What? Just like that. And they, listening to scramble. This, listening to the discussion brings something to mind occasionally, but even more so now that the all wonderful discussion we're having today. And that is that uh, when a, a serious problem comes about and you have a group of very Christian people, and you say, well, now we have the best group of people we could find. They find the decision. What is their final decision? Be? And you talk each member of the group, and they have a different opinion about this. Different about that. They're often, in some other agreement, but not totally agreement, and they have different varying agreements too. And the final decision is, what are we going to do with anything? Because if we if we do this, and something should go, and we should be wrong about, oh, that terrible thing going to happen. That terrible thing going to happen. And I think what God is really saying to us is. If your decision is made on the basis that you honestly think in every fiber of your spiritual being that you are being honest about wanting to do something because you don't 
know of a particularly wrong thing related to that. You don't know what uh, the right thing is because you've never tried a certain thing before on this unique problem you now have to deal with. But if you then apply the best thinking you have as a group to this problem, and as you work your way through it, you deal with the complexity of solving the problem and this and that and Instead of hacking away and biting your fingernails at every move you make for fear of maybe I'm wrong here, maybe I'm right, I'm in, as long as you think you're really doing what God has led you to do, until you have it, you say that God, until you show me very differently, otherwise, I will keep doing what I'm doing. God says, that's all I have to do. You know, really what I you believe you have brought me to do. Then let me worry about the finalizing of it. And we are so reluctant, I think, sometimes. The more we learn about technology with the passing of age, the more we feel that we've got to have confirmation of everything that we do. We've got to, I'm like, can't you see how this going to fail like this? We have failures all over the place. We're looking for success, and only he has a success. We knew it a full success was the way it shows us to begin with. We didn't know what it was, only he knew. Just do it. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, many times when we Jesus has asked a question, and his reply, is you scratching your head. Mm. Many times he does this, and maybe the idea is, it's just to cause this conversation, to, to dig deeper into it. Sometimes you know, the rabbinical method has yeah. always been give and take, uh, yeah. without necessarily resolution. In yeah. fact, that's a rarity, even today. They talk about the Torah back and forth, with no sense of, we're going to resolve it in the next hour. They just talk. And that's what Jesus would have done, too. Well, the, what's, what's the first thing that God said to Adam and Eve after they did what they did? Where are you? Where are you? It was Where a question. Like, like he didn't know where they were. Like he didn't know what they just did. You know? And he was, questioning, he was questioning them because it was kind of like, what did you just, you know, where are, you're no longer with me, okay? Um, and he wanted them to realize that. And, the, and when you keep say, kept saying, you know, what did he want him to do? He wanted him to trust him. Yeah. That's, what he wanted, that's what he wants us to do, is to just <clears throat> trust him. Stop trying to figure this whole thing out and just trust him. That's like, give us, this, give us our daily bread. bread instead right. of like, give us all the bread we ever need. No, give, every day, give us, well, trust him instead of the bread. Right. I guess that's what you're saying. Well, you know, and, and, you know what, the, 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 what you, well, it's prayer. Yeah. You know, how will be the, you know, our Father who art in heaven, the Hebrew for heaven is the air that I breathe. So I can't survive without Him. You know, I can't breathe without Him. So it's not just the specific thing, it's everything. Don't be so, you know, closed minded. Just trust Him in everything. These, these guys were very human, and I think that certainly I, I, I fall into this a lot. Is you get so focused on the problem and addressing it right now rather than Jesus stepping back and said, you're addressing the problem the wrong way. Just tell it to stop. And of course, we can do it because we have Jesus in us. And so he's continually shifting them into this new kingdom of God paradigm where if you come with me, all this will be taken care of. And it, it's a, just an intriguing lesson that if I were in the boat, I'm, I'm with you. If this boat's sinking, what are we going to do? And Jesus is saying, when you're in a boat that's sinking and you, and you can't do it, or you know you can't do it, I am here. It seems strange that uh, <coughs> the seasoned sailors uh, are in a problem and they ask the one guy in the boat who doesn't know anything about sailing. <laughs> well, so they believe. <laughs> so they, uh, they, they should know that you turn the boat in facing the wind. That's all that hits you in the, in the uh, front of the boat, not uh, rock the boat from the side and tip it over. So it's, uh, they, it's like they gave up all their common sense and all their training and uh, panicked. And uh, it seems... Uh, strange that they would uh, uh, have lost all their confidence in themselves. And how, and, uh, often, how often do we end up there? I think we're always in the boat. Yeah. What happens very often, that's a, it's a lesson for the day, too. 
when the people say, uh, don't you care if we drown? Basically what they say, are, they are afraid. They have a fear. And what happens in the, to us today is every time we have a, a problem out there, fear grips us. Yep. And fear is a sin. And sin is the devil who gets in our, ourselves. Yeah. And we lose our faith. Do we have faith already? Yeah. Just a lot of faith. You don't have faith at that time. Thank God for grace. People have faith in there. Yeah. It's, it's a, no matter what it is, he will bring us through. We believe in him. Yes. Is, what is Satan's way of rocking the boat, so yeah. to speak? What, what was Jesus' answer to the next time this yeah. happened? Yeah, please. What was yeah. Jesus' answer to the next time this same thing happened with the disciples in a boat? Why didn't you believe? No. What, ha what did he do? They went out by themselves. And then what happened? What did Jesus do? He walked out. He there. walked, he walked there. down the water. He said, hey, you're afraid in the boat? Come on out here. So what? We'll talk about another big paradigm shift. Was it Peter that walked out on the water? And Peter did, he and he got scared. Took his eyes off of Jesus, and, and down he goes in the world, said, and he said, "Oh, you of little faith, come on, I'll get you again." But it's cool. it's again instead of being in the boat, they're, they're terrified in the boat this time. Said, so, "Okay, I'm going to take care of you. Stop." And and they're not only amazed, they're terrified. The next time it happens. He's just sort of walking by in the middle of the night. They're trying to go five miles, and I think they spent like six hours trying to do it some long time. And he just merely is walking along, and he said, "Come on out here. We'll walk. It. We'll walk across." But they were still terrified. And they yeah, they were. And they were terrified of him. To speak to what George just said about common sense, what do we all have in common? Slack of it. Well, uh, think about it. We all have a garden. We're all sinners. Yeah, the garden. Okay. Yeah. Don't rely on your common sense. Because the one thing we all have in common is sin. Hmm. Rely on Jesus rather than your common sense. Rely on his sense. Well, which, Jesus. Which he gives us. Which right? is perfect. Yeah. You know, to be overly simplistic about this whole situation. We're in the midst of the, the, the federal the elections for this country here, which is going to be Republican, now we're going to the Democratic. Now, particularly the, the plus or minus event, uh, party or so forth. But in the midst of all the thinking and all the discussion that goes on, if a group of people said, boy, have we got things in We got problems like you can't believe, and so many little over there. What do we do? And the answer is, we have some people in each of these parties that believe we read the scripture and you ask God for help. Well, we can't do that. That's we're going to be prejudicial. That's one thing in favor of this and that and that. If you really are, people really like the answer each other, and you go to the one you think already has close, has the answer, and then you, you don't have all of what he has, but he's the one who has the closest to the answer you're looking for. That's what you want. Three. Thank you, Joseph. I mean, you write at faith, you, you don't just, just say, I have faith, but you have to act on it. That's it. And that's what everybody's home. That's no, good. Yeah, do it this way. No, you have to come. Yeah, do it this way. And I go, I'm not on. Well, across that sea on a hillside, Jesus, according to Matthew 5, gave a long teaching. No. And during that teaching, he said these things. For the idolaters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what I'm hearing from all of our discussions, which have been really wonderful, is trust Jesus. Amen. Every day. He agrees that every day has its problems, but basically every day has a big ongoing problem because we spend too much time thinking about our input rather than God's input. All right, we are going to wrap up with some prayer. I'm going to invite you to offer prayers as you're led, and I'll conclude with the final prayer. So let's take the remaining minute and offer up some prayers to the Lord.
Lord God, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your boat. Father, we just thank you for the trust and the faith in you, knowing that you have the answers. And Father, I just pray that you would give each one of us boldness, strength, and um, that we would rely on you, Lord God, when we are challenged, when we are fearful, and when we are overwhelmed. Help us, Lord God, to ever rely on you. Thank you, Lord, for this time we are in fellowship. And uh, open, as your words say, open the eyes of our heart. Our arms, and you may see the wonders of your world. And we thank you for uh, all the brothers here. And uh, we pray for uh, enlightenment, and we see the world, and the world transform uh, our lives. And the Lord use us in a mighty way for his kingdom. Lord, to where else would we go? You are the life. Thank you, Lord. When Jesus asked his followers if they still had no faith. I hope that uh, when I'm faced with any troubles like that, that I will have the faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for expanding our territory and for having your hand on us at all times and pulling us out of the out of the deep when we need help. And we thank you for keeping us from evil and keeping the evil one from us. Forgive my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Increase our dreams. Mm -hmm. Lord, your church has often been likened to a boat. In fact, architecturally, many churches are built in the shape of boats to remind us that we're in this together. Yes. And that you're our captain, Lord, the captain of our souls. Yes. And as you take us into faith, which is your precious gift to us, as you lead us to the other side, to places unknown, May we know fellowship with you and one another. May we trust in your goodness. And may we see you as you are, the Lord of all creation. And any worries we have, Lord, we cast them at your feet. We rest with you. In your name we pray. Amen. So next week we'll get into our five. And for those of you that have assignments for tonight, please plan to put those up there.